Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil, and today we again take a turn down that youth road of asking our youth, former youth that is, why they've left the church or why they've continued to stay. And today we get the privilege of sitting down with our first lady of our group, former group, and her name is Jordan. Jordan tells why she stayed, why she continued to go even to this day, and why she is in encouraging her three girls to go. So this is a really exciting episode for me on a lot of different levels. Hope you'll enjoy it. And uh, here we go. Hey, come take a walk with me. Not like you used to do. Do something different and put yourself in other people's shoes. Open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction. Change your perspective. Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil. And uh, finally, the wait is over. The very first girl, youth, that gets to be on the show. So I, I'd like you to welcome in uh, a longtime uh, youthy, if you will. Uh, I first remember interacting with her, I think, when she was in middle school. She is no longer in middle school. In fact, now I think she has a middle schooler which is still, for me, even hard to believe and and uh, understand. But, you know, time, in fact, does march on. So help me welcome in Jordan. Jordan, how are you? Great. So I was driving over today, and uh, I was telling my daughter, because she is also in middle school, who is also 11, I think in much like your, your oldest daughter's right around 12, the same age. Yeah. 12, yeah, okay. And I said, do you remember that uh, Do you remember that story I was telling my daughter? I said, do you remember that story that I talk about a lot of throwing up on a ride at Great America? And she goes, yeah, it's one of my favorite stories, Dad. So we're going to tell – I want to tell that story first because – and then we'll get into this. But, but first, I have to get this out of the way because this is a new thing I'm starting. So uh, what size shoes do you wear? Um, eight and a half. Eight and a half. What is your favorite pair of shoes to wear? Like type? Yeah, type or maybe you have a brand or, or maybe a uh, style or, or whatever. Yeah, flats and uh, flip-flops. I can live in those all year. Yeah, okay. So the reason why I say it is because the point of my podcast is we're actually walking in your shoes. So I just want to maybe visually see we're walking in again at an eight and a half. Mm-hmm. And we're basically having flip-flops on, right? Because that's your preferred footwear of choice. It is. All right, fair enough. So uh, so now let's talk about this story. So, Jordan, do you remember this? We were on this ride at Great America. The it's eagle. called the Flying Eagle, yeah. right? And you're sitting next to me, and there's this little, like, lever thing, uh, kind of like a kind of yeah. toggle rudder thing. And you're kind of whacking it back and forth, and basically it would make the, the, the cart, in a sense, go up and down or sideways or whatever. And I said, uh, if you keep doing that, Jordan, I'm going to get sick. And I don't think you believed me. Uh, by the way, we're in Jordan's house, so you'll hear some kids in the background, but they're not dying. They're <laughs> fine. They're 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 okay. They're being uh, uh, overseen by older sister, so it'll be all right. But anyway, so we end up getting off the ride. I get off the ride, and I calmly, coolly walk over, and I throw up. And forever I have lived with the fact that I've probably scarred children for life in 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 the flying eagle ride it was a kitty ride for sure it was <clears throat> and in fact my family and i went to it's now not great america anymore it has a different name but uh i tried to ride that ride again and <laughs> and i and i couldn't so so jordan thanks for giving me some moments uh today i appreciate it uh, i know you're a mom of three and and you got a husband so really you're a mom of four let's be honest <laughs> uh but i do appreciate you giving me some moments so We'll, we'll, we'll get started with this one. Do you remember the first time coming to church or youth group or, or any of the, anything like that? And, and how old were you? Um, I grew up in church. So the first time would have been like, I don't know, maybe five years old. Um, so I don't have a lot of memory of that. But I started youth group um, right, right when I got into junior high. So. So, so would you consider yourself by all intents and purposes a church kid? Um, yes. Okay. Now... Now, I remember you growing up, like I said, now your mom was, was pretty active in your life. And did your mom ever make you go to church? Was it ever a mandate like, Jordan, you're going to go or else? Or was there anything like that? Uh, no, she never had a made. She never had to make me. I, I willingly went from what I remember. 
Okay. Even as you grew into, you know, high school and, and or even middle school and then and then into high school, there was never a Jordan, you have to go or, or else. No, that's when I wanted to go. If anything. That's when you wanted to go. If yeah. anything. Cool. All right. So. Um, so how old are you now? If you don't mind sharing. Uh, 31. 31. <laughs> OK, that's awesome. So just to give us perspective that obviously some time has passed. Right. So um, was there something when you look back then, if you can try to think back to those, you know, middle school, high school days uh, in youth group, do you, is there anything you learned back then that you're still using today? You mean during? Yeah, during that time, you like know. Like during youth group or yeah. just in? Yeah, yeah, during those youth group days. We'll say specifically those those youth group days. Um, I, I don't know. Okay. I don't know how to answer that. I don't know specifically how to answer that. That's okay. I mean, I didn't know if there was like maybe a life lesson or if there was some kind of, you know, principle or or anything like that that you really maybe kind of, you know, like I said, heard back then that maybe you're using still. Um, I probably didn't think about it back then. I I think about it now when I think about my youth group years and, you know, as a preteen and teen girl you know like liking to get attention so saying things doing things that are kind of when you think about it now kind of stupid and embarrassing and back Mm. then I thought was just awesome and was really gonna get me somewhere so I don't know okay nothing really specific okay all right and and I I didn't I'm not necessarily looking for anything because again this is this is your perspective and, and this is this is your you know, journey, not mine. So, okay. So, um, did you ever really feel like you made a decision for Jesus, like accepting him as your savior? And and if you did, um, in those days, what, what did that look like? What did that event look like? What did that, what were, were the kind of circumstances around that? You know, it's really interesting because as a youth, I definitely believed in Jesus. I wanted to, I wanted the whole concept of being a you know, quote, Christian, and I was really good, really strong morally, and that carried me through high school, youth group, and everything. I remember, you know, I had some friends that were non-believers, and they would make comments, you know, like the burn the cross, we need firewood type of comments and stuff just to try to be funny, and I would always put a stop to it. I would always, you know, I was never embarrassed to make reference of my belief in Jesus, but it was still... I was still a teenage girl. It still wasn't really cool. It was a little different at youth group because we all were there and assuming we were all there for the reason, the same reason. Um, So I was always really good morally and standing up for my belief, but walking all the time through high school at home, um, it, it didn't quite look like an ideal Jesus follower, I guess, until I got older. So... You're 31 now. What would you say to the 16-year-old Jordan now? Now, like, I mean, you're you're gonna have a 16-year-old soon enough. So think back. What what would you tell that that 16-year-old Jordan? You know, probably what I tell my daughter now. We have comments. She's homeschooled, but she does do some classes through a um, charter school here in town, and uh, she has the same struggles that I went through. She has drama with her friends, and she has, you know, things that go on that make her angry and whatever. And I have always told her that, you know, Olivia, at the end of this life, none of this is going to matter. Who you were friends with, and what they did to you, what you did to them, you know, none of it's going to matter. What's what's going to matter is did, was your life, you know, I'm trying to think of the word, but was your life reflecting Jesus? Were you, were you Jesus to other people? Did you give grace? Did you love the way he loved us? And, you know, so none of this is going to matter. Just, it doesn't matter. And I, I tell her that all the time. And that's kind of, you know, how I think of it. Is that kind of what you would tell the 16 year old Jordan? I would. I just not to worry about any of that and just to, keep your mind on him okay sounds vague but (laughs) no that's okay so um do you remember that exact moment when you feel like jesus really you you really took hold of that and really made that your your faith i don't remember a specific time i just remember as i got older and as i you know just kind of grew as a person i just kind of had to figure out which 
way I wanted to go. I was a mom pretty young. I got married young. And so my life wasn't the same as other people. Um, definitely not the same as a lot of my other youth friends. I did things a little, a little different than them. And so I just kind of, in a sense, grew up a little extra quick and just had to, had to make a decision about where I wanted my life to go. Okay. So in that same respect, you know, youth group, uh, a, a number of youth have said, well, it was fun. It was exciting. We did cool stuff. But, but for you personally, what kept you coming to youth group back in those, you know, middle school and then high school days? What, what really continued to, to fuel that fire for you? Um, I've thought about it uh, a few years back. I was actually thinking about that. And um, there were a lot of different reasons. It was fun. It was something to do. I didn't have a ton of friends, not in high school. I was pretty selective with my friends. And most of them went to youth group anyways because I either invited them or I met them there. Um, a big reason I came back um, was, for one, I went to the church. <laughs> and for two, I grew up with a single mom. I didn't really have... Um, besides her, I didn't really have a male presence in my, or she's not a male, but you know, I didn't have a male presence in my life. And I had youth leaders that were males and, um, I grew fairly attached to, to them. And, um, that was a big deal for me being, um, so close to my, my youth leaders and then my friends. Great. Um, what do you think keeps kids from, from coming to youth group or even nowadays? What do you think keeps kids from, from coming and, and being involved in a youth program, in your opinion? Um, that's really tough because I think, you know, back in my day, which wasn't that <laughs> long ago, so it's weird to say, but... It's we, even weirder to hear. <laughs> let me just say that. It is. Uh, go on. Sorry. Forgive me. I invited friends. It's like I asked my daughter to, like, invite somebody to church, and it's just, like, the end of the world. Like, that involves talking to them, or that involves, you know, asking them to come to church. And it's just, it's such a foreign concept to that to ask anybody to go. And so kids are not really inviting other kids, whether that's from embarrassment or what, I don't really know. Um, I think a lot of times why maybe kids don't stay is because it's not – cool I don't know or whatever the newest word is um it's not cool to go to youth group I don't know it's embarrassing maybe or weird weird kids do it I don't really know I gotta say every time you say embarrassing I, I think of you <laughs> as a 16 15 something year old oh that's embarrassing I'm you not can't do different. that that's embarrassing <laughs> That was Jordan's catchphrase. Uh, just a little insight okay, into that. Okay, I'm embarrassed for you. Okay, is what thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, <clears throat> so going back into you again, um, w do you think do you think the youth group slash church uh, failed you personally in any way? I don't think that it failed me. I think in youth group, you know, youth the youth leaders in particular did the best that they could for where they were at in life and in the church themselves. And um, I, I absolutely think the church is failing um, youth. That's no doubt in my mind. Me specifically um, and my youth group specifically, I do not think failed me. But, um, you know, there's a certain age that kids need to be reached before it's just almost too late. And that age is being surpassed and you know it's church isn't super relevant for youth it's not made to be relevant it's kind of it's a lot of churches are kind of like nursing homes for Christians they're kind of maintaining them and not equipping them and you know kids don't want that I, I've never heard that term before nursing homes for Christians what, what do you mean by that specifically I really have never heard that so this is new to me you know, the point of a nursing home is to kind of, I don't know, stain people and keep them alive as long as possible and just kind of give the same stuff daily. You know, they have their breakfast and they have their walk and they have their puzzle and their bingo and they go to sleep. And a lot of churches, I think, um, maybe unintentionally, but operate that way. They just, they're not, you know, 
attempting to go out and or they're not equipping their people and then they're not going out to reach people which is you know kind of one of our endeavors as as you know christians or jesus followers so so if i'm understanding you correctly you feel like the church as a whole is failing youth but you feel the youth leaders didn't fail you I don't feel like my youth leaders failed me. No, I had okay. issues with them here and there, but um, fail me, no. Okay, and then that that was going to lead into my next question. Is, is so, and maybe you're answering this with a yes. So, did you feel like your youth leaders failed you in any way? No, okay. I think they did fine. Okay, all right. And you can you can call out names. It's okay. We had Chad and Leslie on in a previous episode, so you can call them out as the bad youth leaders, right? Uh, they're some of my best friends right now, so no, I will not do that. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. They're great people, and uh, and and they and in my mind, they were very instrumental in, in a lot of what <clears throat> what was done in in your youth days. So, uh, looking back, what is the greatest memory you have? And then, of course, on the other side of the coin, with that, what do you think is your least favorite memory? Uh, again, during that youth kind of uh, adolescent years. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, least, um, I got in trouble a lot, so I don't know that it was like anything specific. I didn't love getting in trouble. It was mostly by you guy got in trouble. Oh, by me? Yeah, pretty much. You were the one that kind of was like (laughs) sick on people, but yeah, I don't know. I I do remember (laughs) summer camp. You had to go a week without makeup. Is that what you're referring That's to? That's one of them, yeah, That's for sure. Okay. I didn't enjoy that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have a specific thing. I I think that back then I made sometimes a bigger deal out of things than they probably were, and then I got upset when I was called out on it, and so I didn't enjoy that. Um, uh, accountability <laughs> sucks. It does. <laughs> and youth don't have a whole grasp on what accountability means to them. It's because youth are entitled, so it's kind of like a, you know – and that's probably one of the main reasons why they don't like to stay in church or come to youth group because ain't got no time for accountability. But um, hashtag no accountability. That's right. <laughs> and favorite, I don't know. There was a lot of there was a lot of really good ones. I enjoyed almost everything we did except for the game trash can, of course, and happy shakes. But <laughs> I told Chad Leslie we're gonna play a game too at the end just to give you a little uh, little heads up of what's gonna happen. But uh, Chad goes, are we gonna play trash can? And I said. Uh, no, Chad. No, yeah, that was awful. I, I just wouldn't participate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. So as long as Happy Shake and uh, Trash Can aren't involved, you had great memories Great memories in youth group. That's awesome. I did. So, uh, again, talk about your kids because I know as a mom, you, you obviously love to talk about your kids, I'm sure. Uh, most moms do and, and even dads. Uh, what will you tell your, and, and it sounds like you kind of already are, but what are you going to continue to tell your kids about church and youth group and, and why it's important to be involved or why it's not important to be involved? I tell my kids now they're different ages and they have different things going on. So, you know, they have different perspectives on going to church and liking it and stuff. But like I kind of said earlier that this is, this is our life's reason or the reason for life, not going to church, but learning, growing in faith, studying scripture, just, just, just knowing it, knowing and being, um, what's the word? I don't know if it's confident, but just in your ability to share Christ with others. And church is a part of that for me. I do not believe that you have to go to church to, um, be a Jesus follower or share with other people. But I do believe that there is, some definite biblical truth to, you know, like I said, learning and growing and studying in scripture and being around other people, um, that share those same values and faith as you. And, um, I don't really know. I don't, I haven't had to go there yet with my kids so much. Olivia's a little bit cause she really wants to be around more youth and our church isn't there yet. Um, so that's been a little difficult, but I don't know. So going back to this again, um, and I don't know if you remember this or not, and, and maybe you do or, or not. Again, I, I don't know what your memory is in comparison to mine, but how much discipleship do you think really occurred during those formative years, those high school years when you were in youth group? And and maybe talk about what that looked like. Um, discipleship? I don't know that I really 
remember a lot about that. I do remember that one of our um, youth group, uh, what do you call them, like logos or whatever, was rescue. And let, do you, I hope do I'm you not, remember? I think it was reaching every soul, like Christian's ultimate endeavor. Yeah, okay. good job. Good wow. And that was pretty good, Jordan. <laughs> that was a way back machine. Yeah. Okay. Right? All right. Well, and that, so that kind of, you know, insinuates discipleship. I don't, and I just maybe don't have a great memory as well, but um, I don't remember a ton of that. I do remember we were encouraged to bring friends and whatever, but I, I don't, I don't remember specifically being equipped for discipleship in youth group. Okay. Personally. That's okay. Yeah. So, so uh, I don't know if you know anything. Do you know anything about the Barna group? Are you familiar with them at all? No. Okay, so the Barna Group is a Christian research group. They do a ton of research on churches, uh, Christian faith, things like that. So they've done a five-year study on uh, why kids leave the church. And that's kind of the, kind of the reason why we're talking is because, again, you're a former youth. I know you haven't technically, you haven't left the church. I mean, from all indications, it sounds like you, even though you made some choices that normal, uh, and, and not that you're not normal, uh, but most people maybe when they made the choices that they made, you know, you you admitted, you know, getting getting pregnant young, getting married, you know, those are choices that would probably cause someone to leave a church mm -hmm. rather than continue to stay at a church. But you stayed, you kind of in, embraced the, your faith and embraced it. Yeah, you know, I made a mistake, big deal. Okay, not, I mean, whatever. I get you. But, but moved on, right? And so this Barner group, they did a study, a five-year study, as I mentioned, and they gave six reasons why people leave. So I want to go over those with you, see if you agree with them or, or not. You, you know, it's up to you. Uh, but there's six reasons. So the first reason they say people leave is uh, church seems overprotective. Do you agree with that or, or disagree? Um, overprotective, like rules? I don't understand. Yeah, they, they just feel like they've studied people out, and they've said that young people today feel like church seems very overprotective. So, yeah, maybe there's rules involved, maybe kind of a helicopter syndrome. Maybe there's that accountability thing that we were talking about, but it just seems very overprotective. Um, strict, I would say, I don't know if I'd use that word overprotective. It doesn't, I don't, in my opinion, it doesn't fit very well, but I would say, um, if strict goes along with that, then yeah, I would agree. And you and I grew up in the same church, right? You know, I went to junior high and, and high school through, through the A church. different era than me, but different yes. era. Yeah. Much different <laughs> era than you, but yes. But, uh, but we, we did grow up kind of coming out of that that same church. And, and again, that's why we're talking. So, uh, t number two, reason number two, uh, teens and 20 somethings experience of Christianity is shallow. Yes, definitely. I you agree with totally that. Agree with that. Oh yeah. So why do you think, why do you think people think of Christianity as being very shallow in, in their faith? Do, do you kind of have an idea on that? Well, I think that, um, teens, um, and young adults, uh, oftentimes will be cultural Christians and they will identify as Christian because that's their family's identity. And so even into your 20s, I think that you kind of like, oh yeah, I'm, you know, because that's how you grew up and that's what you are. So having the maturity to make your own decision that you're going to follow Jesus regardless of what your family did or that you're not going to, I think is, um, you know, Whatever. <laughs> uh, I really love what you said there, especially with that identifying, because that's such a catchphrase, catch word now in our society of, oh, I identify as this or I identify as that. So I, I love how you put that. That was very well put. Uh, reason number three, uh, churches come across as antagonistic to science. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that takes specific people to believe that. But yeah, def I definitely think that that's a, a thing. Yeah, that it kind of stops people from coming because they yeah. feel like if you're a Christian, you can't obviously subscribe to science or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, it contradicts each other yeah, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so young people's church experience related to sexuality is often simplistic and judgmental. Um, yes. Yes, I think it can definitely come across that to people. So. Okay. All right. Um, reason number five. Uh, wrestling with the ex uh, exclusive nature of Christianity. Now, the verse I've been quoting is uh, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Seems pretty exclusive. I mean, that sounds like a very exclusive statement. So with this, people are still wrestling with the fact that Christianity is the only way. What do you think of that? Um, I, I mean, I agree with that, and I... 
I don't know. Really, so I'm sorry. What are you asking specifically? In yeah, that question? sorry. So basically, what they're what they're trying to say is is that some people are still wrestling with the fact that it's so exclusive, right? That mm-hmm. that there's got to be another way. That there that there isn't just one way. That there that that Christianity can't be the only way or, or Jesus can't be the only way. So it's so exclusive, like kind of like Costco. You, you, I'm sure you're a Costco member, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone loves Costco. Everyone's a Costco member. I, I, I actually get hives when I go to Costco. That's another story. <laughs> but my point is, is that with Costco, you, you, it's exclusive. Like you got to have a membership. You can't just roll up into Costco and be like, Hey, I'm going to buy, you know, a 85 gallon drum of mayonnaise. You yeah. Know? You got to show that card. You got to, you know, so it's very exclusive from that standpoint. So I think the reason that they're discovering is people are leaving is because they can't handle that it's so exclusive. And Everyone should be yeah. welcome in. It shouldn't, you shouldn't have to have a membership card. And I think so that a lot of people think that. I think that if people thought more of the fact that Jesus isn't exclusive, that maybe, you know, they think church is, but Jesus isn't exclusive. Regardless of, you know, what you say or do, everyone, everyone has already been paid for, right? And so... It's not exclusive. I just think that people probably look at that it that way. That 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 it makes it feel exclusive. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, church feels unfriendly to those who doubt. So, in other words, if someone was struggling, let's say your daughter, any of your daughters, daughters, were struggling with doubt, would they feel unfriendly to the fact that that they're struggling with this doubt, or do you feel like that there would be people around that could kind of help support them and kind of help them walk through that doubt? Because, again, they're saying this is one of the main reasons why people leave is because of this doubt aspect. I think that's true. It's funny because in the, the church we attend, it's kind of like the opposite. It's like you can almost, you know, like sense or smell people with doubt. And you just, you know, right away those are the people you're kind of drawn to and want to talk to um, personally in, in the church that I attend. But, yes, I, I think as a whole that's definitely a truth. Okay. So I asked this of, of Chad and Leslie, and, and I just think it's a great question. And so I'm going to ask you, um, because you are still, you know, faithfully attending, you still, you know, subscribe to, to the faith and, and still believe in Jesus. And so, and I know you're still very much connected to a lot of the old youth. In fact, pre-show, you were, you were giving me some more names to, to kind of maybe go and talk to about this. So let's pretend for a second we're in this I don't know, grand arena, the arena doesn't necessarily matter where we are, but we're in this grand arena and every youth that has ever been through, you know, the program that you were a part of are, is in the audience. Okay. So kind of imagine with me and your center stage, which I know probably freaks you out already, but we're going to ignore those feelings. Okay. And just, and, and, and think about this. You have an audience with them. What would you say to them right now? All the old youth that I knew. Yeah. That's what you're saying. And even the current youth that, well, I mean, they're all adults now, but yeah. What would um, you say to them if you had that opportunity? Man, it's a really diverse group. It is. Just thinking about yeah. them. So that is just really difficult. Um, I think that, I guess I would just have to share, I don't know if I'd share my testimony. Yeah, I probably would. But just my my personal experience, I, I made a choice. Um to continue to going, not only continue going to church, but to decide to not be a cultural Christian and to build the faith on my own, build my faith on my own and learn how that could change my life. And it did. And I guess I would just say that, you know, we are only given one life. It is nothing in compared to eternity. And this one life is our chance. It's, you know, it's our chance to show others, you know, what it means to be a Jesus follower. My pastor makes a reference or whatever. He tells a little thing. I don't know what you call it, but basically talks about, you know, if someone was, if someone was offering a million dollars and, you know, like everyone, you know, gather here at this time and you can get a million dollars for free or whatever. How many people would gather there? I mean, everybody, everyone who heard about it, I'm sure would, would go and get their million dollars. But how many people, you know, would go and gather if you said, you know, here's your chance to live in eternity with Jesus and, you know, to be saved through him and to, you know, spend eternity in heaven with him, which is obviously far more important than a million dollars, but how many people would run for that? And it's just, you know, I guess I would just, I guess I would just share 
my life and that I've never looked back and I'm not perfect in any way, but I try really hard and I, I grow every day from it. So I guess that's just what I would say. And then about 20 people would leave and (laughs) (laughs) Jordan, that's, that's so incredible, right? Because for, for me, and, and I think even Chad and Leslie and, and uh, hopefully other leaders that I get an opportunity to sit down with, I, I'm just being candid. I I don't know if I would have known 16-year-old Jordan to say what you just said. Probably not. <laughs> In fact, I'm pretty confident. I, I don't think 16, even 17-year-old Jordan would have said any of that. And so that to me is a testament of where you've come and how far you've come and how you have not allowed poor choices, you know, whatever they may be, to stop you, derail you, you know, uh, cripple you, uh, paralyze you, whatever you want to say, because you've continued to move forward. Why? Why? I don't know if I have a specific answer. I just think that it's, you know, we all have choices in life and I've made some pretty difficult ones and they're even the ones that I've made to follow Jesus and not, and to end certain friendships and whatever have been some of the hardest choices I've ever made. The right choices aren't always the easiest choices, but, you know, I feel different when I am walking and following Jesus and it's a life changing different. So I don't know. Wow. Uh, thank you. So we're a play game, a little, a little more lighthearted. Um, I know you, it's not trash can just for the record. <laughs> Good. Cause I'll fail. Um, it's not trash can. It's actually, it's a, it's a fun game. So you have to roll a dice and it's in a North Carolina baby blue cup, so it is. has to be, right? So there it is. I'm going to let you roll. That's a die. And so we have a little table in front of us here, so just uh, throw it on that. Based on what you roll, uh, that's what you get to answer. And it's just a fun question. And it's a fun game I like to call Senseless. So here we go. You got number six. <laughs> you were the only second person to get number six, so that's mm-hmm. awesome. All right, number six is this. <clears throat> Dinner with one person, dead or alive. And obviously the obvious answer would be, oh, I want to pick Jesus. Maybe that's the obvious answer. But <laughs> but outside of Jesus, who who do you think it would be? Oh, goodness. That's really, really difficult. Um, uh, one person. Sorry. It would probably be um, an old friend of mine um, that passed away when I was in high school. His name was Randy. So that would probably be the one. I think I know why, but do yeah. you want to elaborate at all? Um, he was a boyfriend, friend, um, for a couple years in high school, and uh, he committed suicide um, my senior year of high school. And, um, you know, I had a lot of love for him, just as a person in general. Um, and uh, I've always been left with why. I, you know, have been left with a lot of guilt and wondering what if or what, you know, and what if I had done or said something different? Not a hundred percent knowing um, where he was at with with Jesus. So um, yeah, that would be the reason. That was your senior year. Yeah. What year was that? Sorry, just for my uh, memory too. It was um, two thousand five. Two thousand five. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good <laughs> wow. Well, Jordan, thank you. I want to end. Uh, I want to end our time together with just saying thanks again. Um, you know, I know you have a lot that you're juggling, and a lot of kiddos, and husband, and and all that other stuff. And and uh, I, I know some of this has probably been kind of maybe difficult to walk through or walk down again. And 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 I thank thank you for that. And uh, and I just want to close with this. You know, <clears throat> life is life is really about walking in someone else's shoes, right? Because without walking in someone else's shoes, you're never going to gain any perspective. Right. Thank you so much, Jordan. Appreciate it. Thanks.